last year, I mean, we missed the playoffs by one point. And I had, a, I had probably my most enjoyable coaching year with RCB last year. And I got fired, but that's okay. When I met Virat uh, first up, he had great abilities and talent. He was a young guy, but I, I kind of knew straight away what I saw that he wasn't operating in the best version of himself, to be honest with you. One of the most impressive people that I've met, and I think he's a great leader of people. Um, he's got incredible presence as a leader, but I think he's loyal. He's been one of the mainstays of South African batting in the 90s, getting into the early 2000s. Has played over 100 test matches, close to 200 one-day internationals. And then, of course, he has done the role of a coach. Not just with respect to a particular country. He's a well-traveled coach. He was the World Cup winning coach with uh, the Indian cricket team, moved on to South Africa to coach them to become the number one test team. And then he's handled uh, franchisee uh, cricket teams as well. It's a delight to welcome on the RK Show, the champion in Gary Kirsten. What I'm trying to do today, or what I'm trying to achieve today, is to get into the mind of a champion coach in Gary Kirsten. Thank you so much, first up, uh, Gary, for joining me on the RK Show. Hope things are all right uh, in that part of the world. Yes, we're all good, thank you. All, uh, we're in the middle of winter here, but uh, um, it's, uh, it's, the weather's not doing too bad, so we're okay. Awesome. Right. Let's, let's start somewhere, Gary, because I mean, for, for somebody who has watched cricket all along, you've always come across as uh, one of those dedicated individuals who likes to graft out there in the middle as a player during your career. But then you are now a fine coach in your own right. During your playing days, did you ever think about coaching as a career or it all happened naturally to you over a point in time? I think it happened pretty naturally. Um... I think one of the biggest challenges you have as an ex-player is transitioning into coaching. It's not an easy one. Um, but, um, you know, cricket has been part of my life since I was a, a, a youngster. And, you know, when you turn professional at the age of 19 or 20, I think I was, and then you dedicate 17 years from there to, to the game professionally, I think you kind of are, are more aligned to staying in the game rather than trying to start a new career at the age of 37. Well, I mean, you spoke about transitioning. What's the toughest part when you move on from being a player to being a coach? What's the toughest part? What, what in your opinion, was probably the toughest part for you? I, I think looking, looking um, through your own lens at the game of cricket, um, which, I, which I think can be really dangerous. You, you, you think that the, the young players that you work with, you can't understand as a 21, 22 year old, why they can't uh, um, build their own game plans and understand how to make performances. But you forget that, uh, you know, you at 21 and 22, you were dealing with the same issue. So often when you look at, look at it uh, through the lens of an experienced 37 year old cricketer um, and how to bang out performances, it's a very different space for a 21, 22 year old. So I think for me, the biggest learning that I took early on in my career was to make sure that I, you know, that I started with a clean slate, that um, I looked at every individual and in, in how I could assist his game um, and just looked at him for, for what he stood for, what, what his characteristics were, and then try to help him, um, I guess, become the best version of himself. I mean, that's really what it is, rather than trying to mold him into, into something else that uh, suited me. Uh, one of your biggest assignments or probably one of your earliest assignments or probably the biggest and the earliest, if I may put it that way, was to walk into that Indian dressing room. I know you were probably a batting consultant with the Warriors just prior to that, but your first big assignment as a coach was uh, managing that Indian dressing room. Still recall the first time you walked into that Indian dressing room, you've played with a lot of them, but to actually sit down and talk and probably coach them, if that is the right word to use, or probably manage them, if that is the word to use, how was it uh, entering that Indian dressing room? Well, I think there were two things that were, were key to that journey. The, the one was um, um, that because I was um, going to be spending um, a period of time with some of the best and most experienced cricketers in the world, it allowed me the opportunity just to, to listen to what they had to say and just to um, not feel like I needed to present them with, with, with something that was going to turn their games around and turn their team around. I think it was, it was more me... Um, having the opportunity 
just to really understand who they were as individuals. That was the first thing. And I think the second thing for me was because I was relatively inexperienced as a coach, um, I had in Paddy Upton, who was my assistant, someone that could give me regular feedback on my coaching ways. And I think that's always very important as a coach, often because everyone thinks that we we know it all, which we don't, first of all, <laughs> is that um, um, you don't get feedback. People people aren't people aren't giving you the you know whether you're doing a good job or not. Uh, so having Paddy, they really helped me to grow in my coaching and to learn the the right time to deliver some information to the team, how to deliver it so that players were, were kind of getting you. Uh, I think well, often was it also, was it also a bit more tricky in an Indian environment? The reason why I ask you, Gary, is because, uh, uh, yes, I mean, uh, you had Greg Chappell coming in and he was the coach. There were issues within the dressing room, issues of trust within that dressing room. After that, of course, uh, you know, you, you had the uh, T20 World Cup triumph under Ramahendra Singh mm-hmm. Dhoni. So plenty of things were happening at that point in time. And also add to the fact that in India normally, you don't find people coming up to somebody and say, uh, you know, hey, you know what, Gary? I don't think that is working. We shouldn't be doing that way. That's normally not an Indian way of doing things. They'll keep quiet, probably. So did you experience that? And if yes, how did you kind of overcome that uh, issue? Yeah, I think you used the word trust, which was, which was an important one. You know, they would need to trust me, especially as a foreign coach. Um, they had some success under, under Dhoni. Um, but they had also had some scarring through the, the journey of the previous World Cup. And, and I think what they needed, what they were looking for in, in their new coach was, was to be able to trust him. So it just allowed me the opportunity just to get on with the work, which is the way I love it anyway. So I think in many ways we were, we were a good match, myself and the Indian team, because um, I'm, I'm quite a shy individual and, and I don't really like the profile too much. Uh, but yet I'm prepared to work hard and, and just get into the nets and work with players and mouth. The, play, the place I enjoy the most is in a one-on-one with a with a batsman, and yeah, you know, pretty much did that for three years. So, so I think I, I think I was able to build trust quite quickly with a team. Um, I didn't do many uh, media events at all. In fact, in the entire World Cup, I think I needed one. So um, they they uh, didn't see me on on the platforms and on the spotlight. That helps. Eh? That helps big time in India. <laughs> if they wanted to see me, they they, they would find me in the nets. <laughs> And, and when I talk to you, I mean, on the aspect of coaching, coaching itself kind of covers too many arts, doesn't it? I mean, coaching, probably you would look at uh, the word coaching can be used to a 10-year-old kid whom you are taking to the ground and trying to teach him or her about the basics of batting or keeping or whatever the case may be. But when you talk about an international cricket team, is it more about managing a dressing room uh, pretty similar to what a manager of a football team would possibly do? Well, it's that and a whole lot of other things. Uh, I think sometimes the definition of coaching is, is, is not articulated really well. You know, there's a, you know, there's a lot involved to it. But if someone asks me a broad definition of coaching across all levels, I would say um, your primary responsibility as a coach is to facilitate the learning of the player. And I say that uh, very importantly. It's, it's, um, it's the facilitation of the learning rather than, it, than the instructing of the learning. And um, at the end of the day, the player crosses the ropes and he needs to be armed with information um, around his own game and, and his skill sets that's going to allow him to go and make the performances. How, and, how do you relate um, to... Sorry, go on. Go on, Ken. Sorry. Yeah, and, I, and I just, just, to, just to finish that, and I think, and I think for, for, for me, my, my role as a coach is to be really curious around your thinking as a player. I want to ask you lots of questions around why you think you should be doing it this way. Could you consider doing things slightly differently? And I think then instead of having that instructional mindset, you now have an influence mindset where my influence is based on my curiosity. And that's why my relationships with Tendulkar and, and uh, Dhoni and, and, and a couple of the senior players were good ones because I was really curious. Now, curiosity is a wonderful word that you use because I was just coming to the aspect of how you relate to different kinds of players. I mean, on one hand, you've got a Gautam Gambhir who loved the challenge, was a left-hander himself, you were a left-hander yourself, loved those tough situations, tried to graft his way through. On the other hand, you had a Virendra Sevak and then you had an institution like a Sachin Tendulkar as far as batting is concerned. So in terms of approaches, how did you approach these varied characters? Everyone different. Um, obviously, the, uh, the, the one that 
the kind of personality that resonated with me was someone like Gotham Gambia. You know, we, we were very similar types of players. So our conversations were easy, but it was very important for me, whoever I worked for, that I, that I, that I got to understand their core as cricketers. You know, what is their identity? What do they stand for? How do they want to play? A conversation with Verinda Sewe was very different to um, Gotham Gambia. And I think once each player saw that um, they could confide in me in terms of the way they wanted to play the game, then my influence became more meaningful to them as individuals. And that's why I say, it's a, for me, it was more around how do I, how do I facilitate the, ve- the best version of Verinda Sewe or the best version of uh, Sachin Tendulkar? And that for me is the skill of coaching or the art of coaching. And uh, often we look at coaches and we say, oh, do they have technical um, uh, no, abilities um, to take players to the next level? I think it's more around how you facilitate uh, the learning of an individual. And coaching, Give me a, sorry. Coaching, for me, coaching for me is also not, a, not about looking at the results column, although we, although we measured there. Coaching is, growth, is, 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 is the growth of an individual and teams. That's all it is. You know, and if you've got a good team, you're going to win more games than you're going to lose. But coaching is, that is what it's about. Um, yes, everyone says, oh, you know, you know I, don't, I don't look at myself at winning the World Cup with the Indian team, which makes me a good coach, and then coming last in the IPL with RCB saying I'm a bad coach. I'm the same coach. It's very difficult to measure me on, 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 on those results. Uh, fair enough. Although we but- are, yeah, I know, I know. That, that's, that's what I'm coming to. Because, I mean, how do you kind of detach yourself? On one hand, you did talk about the process that you would emphasize heavily on uh, so that the results will take care of itself. On the other hand, you're talking about a world that perhaps judges you on the basis of results. So how do you kind of mentally dissociate with these two? Oh, easy, because I, I, I don't focus on the results. So it's easy. You know, for me, my, my, the, the journey of coaching and the thrill that I get out of it is to you know, uh, have a player in a certain space and then able to help him move to another place and have a team in a certain space and be able to move them to another place. That for me is, that for me is where the, the real joy in, in coaching sits. Um, in fact, um, the results take the joy out of coaching. <laughs> and <laughs> When you're talking about the likes of Sachin Tendulkar, I remember you saying uh, in the recent past that there was a point in time after 2007 when he wasn't particularly keen on continuing. So, you're, you're, in effect, you're talking, you're talking about one of the greats of the game uh, who is probably, uh, you know, in, in a sense, wanted somebody to speak to him to possibly even carry on. Take us through that particular phase of a Sachin Tendulkar and the kind of conversations that you had with, the, uh, with Sachin. Um, twofold. One is um, um, he wasn't enjoying himself. I mean, it's as, it's as simple as that. And um, when, we, when we go to the absolute basics of why we play the game, it's because we really enjoy ourselves. You know, even though it might get really hard sometimes. And when we stop enjoying ourselves, we don't want to play anymore. We lose the motivation to play. So my prime responsibility was to get him to enjoy himself. Um, so that was the first part of it. The second part of it was in a coach or a leader of people, he wanted a friend. You know, he wanted... He wanted someone that he could converse with, that he could talk about his game to. Um, and uh, I just happened to be the right person at the right time for that. You know, I just really enjoyed working with him. Very gentle person, um, uh, highly professional and competitive around his own game. Um, I just was very curious around his game. I kept asking him questions uh, pretty much every day around why he did this, why he did that, what is he thinking on this. So I think our relationship developed uh, because of that. Um, um, I, he, he got the joy back into the game. I mean, he got 18 international hundreds in the three years that I was with the team, which is remarkable effort. Um, but I think he just got the joy back into playing again. And that was also a period of, uh, should I say, a bit of transformation as far as Indian cricket was concerned, wasn't it, Gary? Because around 2007, you had this T20 World Cup, which was still in its infancy. You did not have the likes of Sachin or a Dravid or a sort of Gangli taking part. You had this Mahindra Singh Dhoni coming in, conquering the entire world in South Africa. And therefore, that was seemingly one way of, uh, you know, getting away from you know, uh, dealing with a different format. I mean, you had T20 format, which was led by Mahindra Singh Dhoni to begin with. Then he graduated to a one-day captain. And then, of course, eventually became the test captain. So in terms of uh, getting everybody on board, on one hand, you had the senior, so to speak. 
And also, on the other hand, you had a Mahindra Singh Dhoni and his ascendancy to become the permanent captain in all formats. How was that phase for you? Well, I think it worked really well because, um, you know, uh, when I started with the Indian team, Anil Kumble was still the captain. And, um, uh, but I think, I think at that point, it was only six months later that uh, he actually retired from international cricket. So, so I think it was at that point that everyone, uh, you know, MS was in, in the wings. And I knew that, uh, you know, I was going to have an extended kind of relationship uh, with, with MS. Um, so I think, that, I think that transition um, was fairly seamless because uh, MS had built up credibility already with the senior players by winning the T20 World Cup. Um, so, you know, for him to come in as captain was not really an issue. In fact, all the senior players really respected him, um, got on well with him, which was great for me because then it just afforded me the opportunity to build my relationship with MS. And then the two of us um, work, you know, w- would work together in, in building, building the team and, wh- how we, and where we wanted to take the team. And I think it's very important for leaders that you complement each other. And we had to find our space, both MS and I. It took a while but just to find our space where I could add value to what he was trying to create with the team. And um, once I understood that and where I could add value to him, um, yeah, it just, it just, it just started to work well. And we had, and you know, and we had lots of talent in the team. So that's, you know, that's important. We were very, very good players, but we just needed to start flying in formation. Yeah. Well, what's the kind of uh, equation that you enjoyed with uh, Mahindra Singh Dhoni? Of course, it culminated in that World Cup victory. I mean, we all remember that fantastic night at the one day in Mumbai. But what's the kind of relationship that you enjoyed uh, with Mahindra Singh Dhoni in the build-up to everything that uh, transpired? Because, I mean, he's, he's probably won it all, hasn't he? He's MS Dhoni? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've said on many occasions that he's... Um, one of the most impressive people that I've met. And I think he's a great leader of people. Um, he's got incredible presence as a leader. But I think he's loyal, you know. That's the most important thing. I'll never forget, uh, just before the World Cup, we were invited um, uh, in Bangalore to go to the flight school there um, and to go and kind of have a look at that. But uh, obviously, we had a couple of uh, foreigners in our support staff. And um, we got word back on the morning before before the whole team was meant to go. And everyone was looking forward to the event that, um, you know, the, the, the three South Africans, which was myself, Paddy Upton and Eric Simons, um, weren't going to be allowed into the flight school because it was seen as a, a potential security risk. Um, so MS canceled the whole event. He just said, you know, if, if these, are, these are my people, if, they, if they're not in, allowed in, um, we, none of us are going. And that was the, that was, that was what he was about. You know, he was just very loyal to me. Um, and I, and I think he saw as well. I mean, there were times where things were, you know, we didn't always win games and we'd have some tough times and we would spend a lot of time just in one-on-one together, just talking through, you know, taking the team forward. So I think we built a a strong relationship in the three years we had together. Mm -hmm. And also, it was also a period of time when you had these youngsters or the Gen X cricketers coming through, isn't it? Because I know you worked with Virat Kohli much later at the RCB. We'll come to that in just a moment. But that was around the period of time Virat Kohli literally banged on the doors of selectors to be a part of that Indian team. Virat Kohli and your experience with him during his younger days, uh, graduating himself to become a regular? Yeah, I think we always knew he was going to be a, a great. But, um, you know, like any one of us, there's certain things that you need to, you know, take into the next step of your journey to make sure that you, you know, that you presenting yourself um, as, as the best version of yourself. And certainly when I met Vera uh, first up, he had great abilities and talent. He was a young guy. But I, I kind of knew straight away what I saw that he wasn't operating in the best version of himself, to be honest with you. So we had a, a number of discussions and um, um, I never forget one when uh, he was, he, he, we, were, we were playing in a one day series against Sri Lanka and he was batting beautifully. He was on 30 odd, not out. And he then decided that he would try and hit the, I don't know who the off spinner was. I don't know if it was Maru Luttrell it might've been, try hit him over long on his head for six, you know, and he got holed out and he walked off the field for 30. And I, did, you know, you know, I just said to him, you know, um, if you're going to take your cricket to the next level, you need to hit that ball down the ground for one to long on. Because you know you can hit a lot of balls up the ground. 
but there's also a lot of risk attached to that. And I think he took that on board a little bit. I mean, he got a hundred in the next one day <laughs> in Calcutta. <laughs> and I, I think, I think, uh, I think our relationship um, was formulated around him as a young player coming in and me trying to kind of say to him, listen, you might think that you've got it, um, but you've got a long way to go kind of vibe, you know, not in, not in as a director way, but you've got a long way to go and you need to, you need to start building in some, some uh, consistent behaviors into the way you play this game that is going to allow you to be, you know, successful. I mean, listen, he's, he certainly did that. Got himself was- properly fit, got himself fit um, and started to hit the ball down to long on for one. And just has helped himself, what, to 40 hundred? <laughs> <laughs> well, moving on, uh, Gary, to the next phase, probably, of your coaching career, which is to be a part of the South African side. How different was the South African side to the Indian side? And how do you go about establishing philosophies or goals vis-a-vis uh, India and South Africa in this case? Different dressing rooms, different personal, different ambition levels, perhaps. Yeah, that's a good question, and I think, and I think for, for, for us as coaches, um, there's real learning in that because um, you can't cut and paste coaching, you know. So, so um, that environment was a very different one and required uh, required um, a different skill sets from me. You know, as much as my basic philosophies as a human being are not going to change, I am who I am. Um, I very quickly realised both very successful leaders. Um, but Graz, Graham Smith was a almost a larger than life individual, um, very vocal, um, great orator, one of the best orators that I've come across. Can move people with his kind of size, and he you know he'd come and hug someone and say, "Listen, I need you after after tea." And he would he, he would he a great motivator of people. Whereas MS just led by example. He was just saying, "This is who I am, and you come with me. I'll take you to war, and I'm going to be in the front." And I think the one non-negotiable of all leadership is guys that um, are prepared to front up to pressure. They're all, co- all captains, all great captains are the same. They're prepared to front up to the toughest of situations. They don't go away. They don't go hide. They don't drop themselves in the batting order. They, um, they're the one that says, I'll take, take the heat, you know. And I think uh, when I was with the South African team, it was really important for me to understand um, and work out very quickly what did the best version of the South African team look, look like? So whilst we, we focused a lot of attention with the Indian team on the test match side and then very quickly moved into the one-day side because of the World Cup, with the South African team, we didn't focus on one-day cricket at all. We focused just on the test side. And a, a 10% tweak there uh, took us to two years without, winning, without losing a test match. Uh, the mental aspect of the game, that is one thing that gets often discussed as far as South Africa is concerned. I mean, there have been uh, tags attached to the South African dressing room uh, over the last so many years. You've been part of uh, South African dressing rooms, which, is, which, have some, which have come so close to winning uh, titles as far as uh, you know, the world of cricket is concerned. How did you go about addressing that? How successful were you, do you think were you in terms of addressing that? Well, I think the first point is that there's no silver bullet to that, you know. <laughs> I think there's been a lot of uh, uh, mental conditioning practitioners and um, people that hover around sport that uh, can give great value to a team in the mental space. Um, but, you know, each, each person is, is processing pressure very differently. And um, um, often... Often uh, everyone thinks, oh, well, the warrior approach is going to overcome any adversity. Uh, the problem in a, in, a, in a sport like cricket where, you know, there's a lot of individual components to, to the game of cricket. It's not like these chains link up and, the, and if, if the chains link up, you can, you can carry a, a kind of a, a weak link. You know, in cricket, you've, everyone's got to front up. You know, and everyone's got to be able because because you might be the one that's got to make the play that turns the game around. So I think um, I think it's not a quick fix and an easy thing to do. But I do feel that um, at some point in South Africa's cricket journey, um, there will be there will be a greater sink of that. And I think every player you'll you'll get a group of players 
that will be able to overcome the burden that exists in there. Because I think that's all it is. It's become a burden. So there's a, there's a mist that comes over the players. It's not easy to deal with. You know, you can have lots of conversations around it. Uh, some people have chosen to ignore it, some coaches. Other coaches like myself have chosen to confront it. Neither have worked, to be honest. <laughs> so we, uh, so we, you know, we, we, we continue that journey. And it's, a, it's not an easy thing for the players to deal with. Yeah, talking about continuing, let's continue your journey as far as your coaching career is concerned to uh, franchisee cricket. I mean, you talk about IPL. What's the biggest difference between coaching a, a, a team in the IPL vis-a-vis -vis coaching uh, an international outfit? Time. Biggest difference, time. You know, it's uh, very difficult to build uh, identity um, with a team, um, with a diverse group of players, um, and 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 to and to build something that uh, can transcend time. I mean, if you take the most successful franchises, what they've done well, Mumbai Indians and Chennai Super Kings, they've been able to build time into their program. So, from one IPL season to the next, the same philosophies, the same cultures apply. So, to shift a culture uh, like RCB, which I think does require a cultural shift, to shift it is take time, and you. But the bottom line is your, you know, <laughs> your, your job's on the line from game one, you know. Um, so then you, when, when there's pressure on performance, you start to crisis manage and um, then you're gone. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Because I mean, when, when, I look at you, you when, I look, when I look at you, when I look at Virat Kohli, when I look at that particular dressing room of the RCB, almost every fan believes pretty much every year that, look, that's a solid looking squad. Why is it that they haven't been able to win that elusive IPL title? Uh, yeah, there's a, I, I think there's a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, I, I, I had um, last year, I mean, we missed the playoffs by one point. And I had, a, I had probably my most enjoyable coaching year uh, oh. with RCB last year. And I got fired, but that's okay. Um, um, we lost our first six games in a row. Um, and then we won five out of our next seven, of which there was a rain out game. So effectively, we won five out of our next six. And uh, I, I, had to, I, I kind of felt that we were starting to move in a direction where how we wanted to build the identity in the team was starting to realize itself. Um, the problem with IPL is that it, it's over so quickly. And then everyone does a, does a, um, a kind of a debrief of the season. And then if the season hasn't gone well, there has to be change. Um, and then you move on to a new set of practitioners, which I think is the worst thing to do. You know, um, you've got to trust what people are doing, trust their work, and also understand that uh, one year is not, a, is not really enough time to, 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 to shift things that are, that are going to allow you to have sustainable, um, a sustainable impact down, down the line. But I mean, if you look at the great franchises in IPL, they have very successfully built a family culture into their environments um, where everyone feels that they can make a contribution. It's not just about one or two people. And I think RCB was certainly what we tried to do last year was try to, try to introduce that as best we could, you know, where the focus of attention was less around Virat and less around AB. Um, and we wanted to bring in some other superstars into the team. We wanted other guys to be recognized for their performances. Uh, but that takes time to build. Uh, let, let's move on, uh, Gary, because the thing that uh, you are occupied currently with is uh, the coach Ed, isn't it? I mean, you're, you're planning to create a platform or you've created a platform where you're trying to help coaches be better at what they are doing, isn't it? Take us through that journey and what you exactly are doing to that. Yeah, we're very excited by that. I mean, um, uh, uh, Coach Ed, which is the name of the platform, the online platform, which is essentially just short for Coach Education, um, is a um, comprehensive, on, fully online opportunity for coaches to further their skills. Um, and the reason why it's fully online is because it has to be, because that's the only way you can get to coaches, really, you know. Um, there are many barriers to entry for coaches wanting to upskill um, across, across all cricketing nations. 
you know, you kind of have to get invited to these level threes and level fours and you, it's difficult to become a better, a better coach. So I think in creating this, what we wanted to do was, was give access of certainly my IP and the, and the guest coaches that we've had on board and, and we've had incredible knowledge coming out of our guest coaches. I mean, uh, we've had Raul Dravid on there and I mean, just, just listening to him and his coaching ideology is, is a treat for anyone to listen to, to be honest with, with you. Um, we've had Justin Lang on there. We've had uh, Andy Flower on there. So a lot of different minds that are presenting information that helps coaches just to, just to learn how to coach. And for me, really what coach ed is about, it's understanding the art of coaching. You know, um, we're very good at, um, sitting with a player in a one-on-one and saying, oh, move your, move your bottom hand around a little bit because that's what I've been told is the right way to hold the cricket bat. But we don't understand how to deliver the information in a way where the player gets it. Um, so, I think, so I think we focus a lot of our attention through this coach education in, in, in getting back to understanding how coaching works. How do you deliver a good meeting? You know, are you just talking and no one's listening to you? How, how do you get people to really, how do you, how do you give good feedback? How do you debrief a match situation out of emotion where you're not just losing your temper because the team's lost, but you actually debrief the KPIs um, so that the information's factual. So I think it's, it's kind of centered around that. Um, um, But I'm excited about coach education because I've learned so much as a coach myself and just to have these great coaching um, ideologies um, that we can share with, with young coaches is fantastic. At this point in time, obviously, uh, Gary Kirsten, you are in South Africa, having invested your time heavily into Coach Ed. Uh, but as far as uh, cricket is concerned, how do you see cricket uh, post-COVID? And where can we see Gary Kirsten going forward? Um, well, it's difficult to say. I mean, um, I'm really enjoying working with, with young coaches at the moment. Um, I find uh, it's a great place to add value because... If you can make a, a, a significant impact on a young coach's life, you can extrapolate that out to the 20, 30, 40, 50 players that he might be working with uh, rather than working with one player. Uh, I've always enjoyed the international space because exactly what I said earlier, where you know, you've got time to work with people. Um, but who knows? You know, I'm 53, going on 53 now. Um, so we'll see. I've still got fairly young kids. So um, we'll see. Hopefully I can just stay in coaching. I, I love it. No, I mean, your smile says it all, that you love coaching. Every time you speak about coaching, you do uh, send out that warm smile. But uh, thank you so much, Gary Kirsten, for taking your time out and uh, being my guest on the RK Show. Really appreciate your time and your thoughts, Gary. 